So today, we're going to talk about some of the latest news coming out of the Vatican and the controversy that it's causing. Suggesting there could be ways to bless same-sex unions. The leader of the Roman Catholic Church responding to conservative cardinals who challenged him to affirm church teaching on homosexuality ahead of a big meeting where LGBTQ plus Catholics are... Hello everyone and God bless. This is Father Mikhail with another, or Father Michael, whichever is easier, with another episode of Living Orthodox. So a quick update, we're getting closer and closer to moving day, which is October 27th for us. We'll be out of this house. I'm starting to empty the bookcase behind me. Um, you know, just bit by bit and getting ready to go. Uh, we do have the GoFundMe up still, as well as uh, a link to my, uh, to my uh, Patreon and my PayPal. Uh, so if uh, anyone wants to donate and they don't necessarily want to go through um, GoFundMe or if they want to maybe do ongoing support for this channel, there's the Patreon option. Um, Patreon donations, to be very clear, go towards things like uh, the, the equipment that I've been using to upgrade my videos, such as an adapter that has allowed me to connect a better quality mic to the phone. And of course, uh, a tripod and ring light, which has allowed me to improve the lighting and the video quality. <clears throat> so uh, further quality improvements, as well as materials uh, for research for videos will also be purchased with Patreon uh, donations. So that said, um, we do need help still. Uh, we're getting there. You know, there's lots of expenses that go into selling a house and buying one and moving. Uh, so we are very uh, tight right now, uh, given the cost of even just the materials to move, such as the, the truck and, uh, you know, the transport for the car, because we don't want to drive the car the whole way. Uh, we have to get a flatbed trailer where we'll be <laughs> dragging the car with the moving truck. Um, just driving it the, the sheer amount of distance from southwestern Ontario to Alberta would just kill the thing. So that said, uh, please like, share, subscribe for more content, and let's get into the topic of today's video, which is the not so startling for some of us in the Orthodox Church, at least, uh, direction that the Catholic Church has been going in for quite some time. So what do I mean? Uh, I myself, when I was a Catholic many years ago, had seen uh, the, the direction that things were heading. You know, the once you start kind of cluing into uh, what truly is the spirit of Vatican II, which isn't just ecumenism, it's pluralism, it's, it's uh, universalism and syncretism. In other words, it's religious syncretism and pluralism. Its whole aim is simply this, to delude faith, to uh, turn someone from Christ and uh, to try to make Christ synonymous with current worldly issues. And this is something that the papacy has always done. You know, when we look at the time of the schism onward, we see constant indications that either the papacy had outside support and interference from um, secular rulers, such as Charlemagne, uh, and then and who, who were anything but Christian in their approach. They just were conquerors who were looking to, uh, to impose their, their Frankish empire upon the world and call it Roman. And, and this was done in, in an attempt to supplant uh, Rome, which was you know, split into two empires, East and West, which the Byzantines, in fact, did, do and did see themselves as Roman. So <clears throat> technically speaking, a, uh, you know, the Byzantine rite is really the East Roman rite. <laughs> so, but that's, that's just a little uh, deviation from, from what I'm really saying. So we have quite the startling issue. Uh, this past weekend, Pope Francis, uh, in his address to his clergy, said, decide for yourselves whether to bless homosexual unions. And this is right around the time where they're getting ready to, to wrap up their synod of, on synodality or whatever nonsense they're calling it, in which not only uh, bishops and clergy are voting, but also laity. And I guarantee you the, the people who've been invited to vote on matters concerning the Roman Catholic Church, and again, my heart does go out to the more conservative and traditionally minded uh, Catholics out there, the people going in there 
to vote are not in your camp. They don't care about tradition. They don't care about conserving morals and faith. They care about inclusivity, which is really just a word for pluralism. Let's be inclusive means let's compromise. Let's compromise not only on what we believe, in their case, and we as Christians as a whole in regards to certain things involving sexual morality, to let's just do what everyone else is saying. Let's, let's just incorporate the world. In all reality, the doors of the Catholic Church have been wide open since they went into schism, since, since the schism of 1054. You know, there, there has, this problem is, uh, to us in the Orthodox Church, it's like, well, we've seen this coming for a thousand years. Um, this is one of the reasons why the very notion of papal supremacy never existed before the schism. It was never something that was upheld by the Church. Because if, if you say that the Church is founded on one office, one man, and that the occupant of that office is in, infallible and supreme, who is going to oppose him? So now he's saying it's okay for priests, as long as it's not a sacramental rite, so there's the legalism, to offer blessings. And his excuse is, well, you know, if, if they want to uh, live a good life and they're asking God to help them leave a good li lead a good life, then what's the harm? Well, the harm is, is that you can't bless sin. Because when you ask God for a blessing, whether it, it, it be in prayer or through the hand of a priest, God is not going to bless something that is antithetical to himself. Sin cannot exist before God. God has no evil within him. There's, you know, you, sin and evil are inversions and corruptions of what God has made. It's not a dualistic concept of, of two metaphysical realities of good and evil. Evil is a perversion and an inversion of the good that God has created. That, that's why it's so disordered. That's why we say disordered, because it's taken from the order, from the natural order God has established. But, you know, I, I saw this years ago, and actually just on the eve of my conversion, or my process of converting to orthodoxy, uh, as some of you would know if you've listened to my talk with Jay Dyer, or even uh, some of my, uh, some portions of, of my life that I've shared, I had a confrontation with, a regrettable confrontation, with a famous Jesuit by the name of Father James Martin. And many of you who are ex-Catholics or maybe even current Catholics and watching this looking for answers or wondering what we Orthodox are making of this, again, my heart goes out to you. I am so sorry that uh, this is something that is most certainly going to be shaking you up and maybe even shaking the faith of, of those who aren't as strong in, in their convictions that Christ is Lord um, and that there is a church. That The thing is, is that there is one church and that, that church I truly believe and I will say is the Orthodox Church. And we see this in, you know, we, we do see that there are, of course, people who are in error in the Orthodox Church. There are bishops who are in error. There are priests who are in error. But you don't see it poisoning the whole structure of the church like it can in the Catholic Church. There is no one who can just change the liturgy overnight and say, you know what, away with the icons, away with the iconostases, you know, uh, no more facing east. That can't happen in Orthodoxy. It's decentralized structure makes it extremely difficult if not impossible to subvert and so this is why you don't see the mass subversion this is why you don't see massive changes to church dogma and doctrine you know when you hear catholics arguing about divorce and remarriage or the use of contraception they're taking particular instances in individual cases which have become public and of course you'll get a group of priests to go oh yeah i guess that's okay to do and they'll, they'll do something that they shouldn't that doesn't mean that's actually what the church teaches Whereas those of us who say, no, this is actually what the church teaches, they'll actually ignore what we're trying to say, even though they can go out there and see it for themselves. Um, Jay Dyer has a lot of talks that kind of cover these themes, and you should definitely go check out his channel if you haven't. I'm not sure there's a single person who watches my channel who hasn't always uh, already or has always watched his too. Um, but watch him and, and David Airhan. Uh, they've got a lot of good things in regards to this. Um, in, in regards to Catholicism, Jay did do a stream yesterday about the issue with uh, with what Pope Francis said and with all its implications, and he did do some debates. And I think it would be very interesting uh, for anyone who hasn't seen that to go and give it a watch and a listen. It's very telling. But coming back to it, uh, to my encounter with Father James Martin. So many years ago, back in uh, 
well, I mean, I say many years ago. It seems like a long time ago. In the grand scheme of things, it wasn't. It was 2018. Um, I went to King's College uh, with the, uh, or was it maybe 2019? I can't remember. <laughs> I went to King's College with a group of uh, really wonderful uh, friends of mine who were, who are probably most of them are still Roman Catholic. I think only only one of them out of that group became Orthodox as well. But we went to attend a talk with Father James Martin. And we really were going because we, we were morbidly curious and we, we actually had intended to confront some of these issues or at least understand how to confront these issues and know what is exactly being said here. What is being said behind closed doors and that isn't being publicized. Uh, he had wrote a book called Building Bridges, which was overtly pro, um, you know, sexual immorality, pro sodomy and, uh, you know, pro same sex union. And flew in the face of, you know, what has always been, in the case of Catholics even, traditional church teaching on that matter. And uh, this Jesuit has, you know, as typical to his order, has constantly been a, a deceiver and a, and a subverter. And he proudly touted the fact in, in this uh, live stream conference that he gave at, at King's College here in London, Ontario, how the Pope had given him his blessing for his apostolate, which is his personal ministry, uh, how the Pope, uh, you know, was supporting him with his work, and he had no problem waving that in all of our faces. So, you know, uh, we listened to the talk, and it became very clear what he was proposing. And even the group of nuns that had funded for and uh, supported the event were clearly in that camp of wanting to see this accepted in the Catholic faith. And, uh, you know, there was a woman there with her son who was uh, identifying as a woman and, uh, you know, getting up and standing up and talking to him through the, through the live stream and crying and saying how oh, she hopes her son can one day get married in the church. And he nods and he says he hopes that this can happen one day too. And so finally I had it. You know, uh, me in my mid to late 20s, I finally had it. I stood up. They put me on the mic and I called him out. I called him out for being a heretic and for teaching things that were opposed to the Catholic Church. Now, I myself was upholding heresies at the time because that's what I believed, um, you know, such as things like annulment and, and other things. But uh, I really confronted him on this matter. And uh, when he got nowhere with me, when he got frustrated that I dug in my heels and I pointed out the errors in his teaching, he, he, he yelled at me and wanted to keep pushing the fight. And I doubt he'll see this video, but if you're watching Father James, you know, God be with you and and and, and correct you because you, you claim to, to be a priest, you're not. Um, and yet here you are teaching things that are antithetical to what a priest does, to who a priest is, and that is someone who is supposed to be a shepherd to help save souls. It's very clear that the job of the Vatican is not saving souls. And why do I say this? Well, they've departed from the faith. If Peter, quote unquote, is the rock of the church, that rock, I think, is, is starting to look a little bit more like a sandy bank because the whole thing has collapsed. The foundation has collapsed. You're now seeing what the weight of this notion of papal supremacy removed from the collegial structure of the church that we even see in Acts has accomplished. It's accomplished nothing. You have liturgical renovations, which actually started as far back as Trent, because the liturgy, the so-called Mass of the Ages, and again, I'm not saying this to be cruel, it's definitely better than the Novus Ordo. But that was a condescension to try to get Lutherans back into the church. So you're already seeing a spirit of compromise, a spirit of reaction, as opposed to response. Response, such as what we see from the Holy Fathers and the ecumenical councils, draws a distinct line in the sand and says, this is right, this is wrong. This is what we believe, this is what we do not believe. And so it's very important for us to understand that. And now you have a line of distinction that must be drawn. There is no Loft, Michael Loftian, Ibarian, as, as Jay cleverly posted in his telegram, interpretation of the interpretation of whoever, whatever said where and when. There is no way to layer this. This is outright heresy, even by Roman Catholic standards, which by Orthodox standards is kind of low. 
Um, <clears throat> but this, this is now more than just heresy. This is a breach in morality. This is a breach in understanding Christian morality and in understanding marriage. You know, uh, recently uh, a, a priest called out Father James Martin for affirming that a, uh, a Catholic politician is in fact married. Well, uh, let's just say the nature of his partnership is certainly not a union. It is not a marriage. It is sodomy. And he claims that his marriage is, that this man's marriage is recognized by both the church and state. Father James Martin has also said things like, oh, you know, and I remember this. This was a huge emotional spiel he gave years ago where he said that, uh, you know, there's this, these two cup, you know, gay men that he knew, these two uh, men who are together illicitly and that they, because of their, their self-sacrifice and their love for one another, that that is beautiful and how could that not be good or how could that not be holy? And so he has constantly been pushing to change the faith. The mask is falling off of these snakes. And as it does, I hope to those faithful, traditionally minded Catholics who truly want to follow Christ and who truly want to follow the Holy Fathers, look back, look back further, go further than Aquinas, go further and beyond Augustine. Look at Carthage. Look at what the councils say. Look at the canons of the 5th, 6th Ecumenical Council in relation to Carthage Canon 2. This also disproves the notion of papal supremacy because if papal supremacy existed, Pope Stephen would not have been overruled and the canons of, uh, of the Council of Carthage would not have been elevated to universal status in the 5th, 6th Ecumenical Council in its second canon. We have to look at what's happening here. The devil is, yes, attacking the Catholics, not because they're right, but because they have the largest concentration of what God values most. All of you. God desires the salvation of every single person. And even if you're going to come close to following in the right direction, even if you're off by a mile, the devil doesn't care. He will do everything he can to push you further away. So what does this do? This affirms errors in those who hold these views and these errors, and they go, oh, the Pope said it. I don't have to change. I don't have to repent. There's the other danger of this notion of papal supremacy uh, and infallibility. Then the other problem is, and, and by the way, you know, what qualifies as an infallible statement? No one has ever clarified that. There's so many interpretations of that with how papal infallibility is supposed to work. They don't even know how it's supposed to work. You know, oh, well, you know, some will say only when he speaks ex cathedra. Well, if he's always the Pope, isn't he technically always speaking from the chair or office of the Pope? But of course, it's like Jay said, we're going to inevitably see a lot of people become sede vacantis. We're going to see a lot of people go in the direction of the SSPX, of the CMRI. And that's not necessarily it either. That's just another form of Protestantism. You've got to look to where the synaxis of the bishops are. So look, look at why, ask yourself why, out of the, faith, of the five ancient sees, did only one patriarch defect? And that's the Pope of Rome. Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, Alexandria, Rome. One defects. Remember what the Lord says. There, there is safety in a multitude of wise counselors. Where two or three or more are gathered in my name, I am with them hasn't been with the Catholics for a long time. They haven't been gathering in anyone's name other than who they call Peter. But even then, who they call Peter is just a simulacrum. It's not real. This notion of papal supremacy isn't real. And furthermore, we don't have this legalistic understanding that, well, because someone can trace their succession back to the apostles, that it means they have apostolic succession. It doesn't work that way. You know, we even see this in Revelations when the Lord removes the lampstand of one of the churches who fell into apostasy and error. He removes it. So I think it's safe to say the lampstand of the Romans has been out for quite some time. Could they return to the Orthodox faith? Yes. Will they? No. And whatever Patriarch Bartholomew and Pope Francis are planning in 2025, <laughs> this just proves how bad it is. And that if truly Constantinople is going to look to rejoin with Rome, they, they've departed from the Orthodox faith and they've lost their apostolic grace, their apostolic succession. So I, I say to the Greeks who are watching this, you might need to decide 
when do you need to get out of Dodge? You have to ask yourself, where is the stable footing? You, you know, you have to pray for them. You've got to pray for the people you're with. Don't just abandon your communities right away. But don't be surprised when certain things happen, when certain things fall through. You know, the Catholics kept thinking, no, 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 no. The Pope will never do this. He will never bless marriages. He will never compromise the faith. He will never say this. He will never say that. And then he inevitably does. And then someone comes out with some form of coping mechanism to try to explain how what he said isn't really what he said and that he meant something different. But yet, you know, you could ask the Pope and he will just probably say, no, I meant what I said. I know when, you know, th there's no sideways interpretation for what I'm saying to you guys. I'm saying exactly what I think and exactly what I'm observing. And what I see is just more proof that the unchanged church, the church that has stayed faithful to her spouse, to the teachings of the apostles, to the canons of the councils, is the Orthodox Church. It is the Eastern Orthodox Church. You know, the, the Orientals fell into schism over 1,600 years ago. And the Papists followed not long after, in the grand scheme of things. I urge you, if you are a, a Roman Catholic, not to take this video as an attack, but as an earnest plea for you to dig deeper, as an earnest plea for you to look into what the Orthodox faith has to offer, what it teaches. You know, th th there's a big difference in how we see ecclesiology. Yes, you know, the, the Roman Catholics say we were a valid church with a valid priesthood and a valid Eucharist. We just lack one thing, the, the Pope. Well, you, you just said we have the priesthood. We have Christ because we have the Eucharist. How can we lack anything? If you have Christ, you can't lack a single thing. So are we now elevating the Pope to the same level or beyond? That's the question to ask yourself too. The other issue is we have to ask ourselves, is this submission to authority out of humility or is this worship of authority out of fear? And I would argue it's the latter. The biggest hang up I've often heard from Catholics who first start converting to orthodoxy is their fear of damnation for quote unquote, leaving the bark of Peter. Utter nonsense, utter nonsense. There's no foundation for that in scripture. There's no foundation for that in the writings of any of the Holy Fathers of the early church. None of it. None. Saying that, you know, Rome was this apostolic see that had primacy of honor. That's true. But you know what? Judas was an apostle and we know how his story ends. And now the Pope has hung himself on his own statements. And we'll see what, what happens. I anticipate that many of you who may not be Orthodox yet are considering Orthodoxy. And again, you know, this isn't to get on a pulpit and, and laugh and say, ha ha, we're right, you're wrong. But it's looking at the facts. And, you know, again, we have our problems in orthodoxy too. You know, Patriarch Kirill says things that I don't always agree with. Um, Patriarch Bartholomew, you know, the, the, no patriarch is perfect, but a patriarch is not a pope. You know, ultimately, my first hierarch is Metropolitan Nicholas. And ultimately, the bishop that I'm obedient to is my Archbishop Gabriel, who I love and respect. Uh, he's an incredible bishop. And, and if you're in Canada and in Rocor, or considering joining Rocor, he's a, he alone is a really good reason to consider. He's a great bishop. Um, and, and he constantly is working hard to try to build up his communities and to support his people. And, and he supports his priest. You know, he does everything he can to provide us with the moral support that we need uh, to carry out our ministries, to do our obediences, which we've been called to do, you know, so it, again, the devil is definitely at work here. He wants to take you away from Christ. He wants you to doubt your faith in him, that there is such thing as a church, or he wants you to stay unrepentant and impassioned in your sins. So, it, you know, if this is something you struggle with, reach out to a good priest who's going to help you pray, get help. If, if you're someone who is struggling with their faith now, We've all been there. I've been there. And you know what? Now's the time to really look into the faith, to really look into the ancient church. You gotta ask yourself, why on the Catholic calendar don't you celebrate saints like St. John Chrysostom? You know, why don't you celebrate um, St. Gregory of Nyssa? Why don't you celebrate St. Basil the Great? Why don't you, you know, celebrate any of the great early church fathers? You have to ask yourself, why? Why do these important voices go relatively silent in favor of more modern saints that appear post-schism it doesn't make sense 
So in my opinion, the distinction is clear. In my opinion, this, this further solidifies that, no, this is not just a different confession or a different confessional style or a difference of wording. They are not the same faith as us. They are heretical. You know, so anyone pushing for a false notion of union, here's your reality check. This isn't it. This isn't it. Heretic. You're a heretic. Stick to what is true. Stick with the church. You know, yes, read the Gospels. Read the New Testament. You know, absolutely. Um, a really good book, if you want to start learning what we believe, is the Longer and Shorter Catechism of Metropolitan Filaret of Moscow, who's a saint, Saint Filaret, Metropolitan of Moscow. Um, there's a really good book uh, by Subdeacon Nectarius, or at least edited and compiled by him, available through Uncut Mountain Press, which is uh, on uh, the life of Metropolitan Filaret of New York, who was one of our first hierarchs in the Roe Court, and who spoke boldly against the heresy of ecumenism. Another great book would be um, An Appraisal of the Ecclesiastical Renovation of Vatican II by Father Peter Hears. That's a really good examination, you know, from an orthodox lens, from an orthodox perspective of what happened in Vatican II, because like the thumbnails implying, this is the spirit of Vatican II. Now, it's not to say that the spirit of Vatican II was always, you know, a Skittles agenda, but that it has always been the intention to open up the structure of the of the uh, papal church, of the papist church, to allow the spirit of the age, the spirit of the world, to come in. That's what the thumbnail is implying. Uh, and you know, we see Father James Martin from his pose at the Metallica concert carrying on like that. This says everything. There is conduct that we priests are supposed to have outside of church, outside of services. That's not it. You know, and and ultimately we we see now through the actions and words of Pope Francis that the Catholic Church is definitely not the church that Christ established. This is a departure from faith. This is a departure from the love of God and the fear of God. And this is instead acquiescing to a love of the world. May God be with us all if you are a Catholic. I Honestly, like I said, forgive me if this seems harsh. I am praying for you. I really hope that God brings you into the church that he established and that you have peace. And if, if, you know, if you need time, then just take your time. Don't rush, but don't wait too long either. The proof is already out there. It's just a matter of being able to accept it. And you know what? Again, if you're, if you're a Catholic, this doesn't mean that you're guilty by association, but it, it, it means it's time to get off a burning ship and jump onto the Ark of Salvation itself. God be with you all. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in and watching, and have a wonderful evening.